Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our next Learn at Home webinar in our series that is hosted by the University of Rhode Island College of the Environment and Life Sciences and more specifically Cooperative Extension. My name is Kate Venturini. I am a program administrator and extension educator here in Rhode Island for the great University of Rhode Island. And I'm very pleased to be here and welcome you on behalf of Extension. Um, I'm just gonna go back a second and I'd be remiss if I didn't orient everyone to what we're gonna talk about tonight, which is the what and when of tick protection. We're very lucky to have Dr. Tom Mather here, who is the director of the URI Center for Vector Borne Disease, which sounds really scary, but uh, he has a lot of great information as a, um, an expert in the United States on vector borne diseases. And so tonight we'll talk about ticks, more from him in a moment. Um, I always like to take this opportunity to share a little bit about what Cooperative Extension is with our um, visitors on these webinars. So basically, Extension is the part of the land-grant institution that's actually charged with facing outward. So the majority of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis um, at work is make sure that folks off the URI campus have access to the science that is generated on the URI campus. And so, we say we bring science-based university resources to Rhode Island's people and communities, and we've been doing that since 1914. Um, Tom and I have not been, but uh, some folks before us have. And um, one of the really beautiful things that's kind of been a, a, a silver lining of the pandemic is that we've realized we can bring science to people in the comfort of their own home via webinars like this. And so thank you very much um, for tuning in. If you uh, would help us in our efforts to ensure that everyone has access to this information, please share um, the link to this recorded webinar, which will be provided um, in about a week on our YouTube channel. I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, tonight's webinar kind of fits um, within our healthy lifestyles area of focus. We have a number of programs that kind of all fit into one or more of these buckets on the right. We work in land stewardship, food systems and agriculture, water resources, energy efficiency, conservation and renewables, and healthy lifestyles. And Dr. Mather's work we're very lucky to have as part of our um, portfolio through his tick encounter and tick spotter resource pages. So a little bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to Dr. Mather. First thing is that on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there are three dots. If you click on those dots, uh, you'll see Q&A that pops up. Um, there is actually a Q&A and a chat function in this interface here. So um, usually when we have larger uh, large audiences, we ask people to just use the Q&A, but I am welcoming any questions for Dr. Mather in the Q&A box accessible through those um, three dots in the bottom right hand corner of your screen or in the chat. We'll do our best to answer your questions um, at the end of the program. Also, you will automatically receive an email from Messenger at WebEx after the webinar. That is an email from me. Just remember my face. That is us sending you a brief survey that we'd really appreciate you filling out. Um, we read the feedback. We use your feedback to make our pro uh, programs better. And so thank you in advance for completing that. It will take you less than 60 seconds, I promise. And also, um, this session is being recorded. As I mentioned, all of these webinars are closed captioned for the hearing and paired in post-production and then uploaded to our Cooperative Extension YouTube channel for easy access. There are a treasure trove of other resources um, from previous Learn at Home webinars in addition to other videos that have been produced on a range of topics. So do check out our YouTube channel. It's a really good source for science-based information, especially information relevant in our state. So um, we have a webinar every other, that should say every other Tuesday at seven o'clock from now through July. 
You can also always send questions into us um, at this email address, coopx.uri.edu. We're on social media, find us. We have a lot of great information to share with you, and we're really grateful that you're all here tonight. So I am going to switch presenter privileges to Dr. Mather, who will share his screen. Um, and let me know if you have any trouble, Tom, you should be good. So again, folks, we will um, hold your questions and answer them after Dr. Mather speaks. But without further ado, I present to you Dr. Tom Mather, Professor of Plant Sciences and Entomology at the University of Rhode Island. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much, Kate, for that um, introduction and for having me here tonight to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. So I don't know this time of night, you know, I've got, um, you all are at home eating dinner, um, but um, I'm not, so I'll do the best I can to keep keep things moving here. Um, I wanted to just say a shout out to the anybody on the webinar tonight that is a recently graduated Master Gardener program. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll have uh, nothing but joy from your Master Gardener's experience and going forward as well outside. Um, Anyway, so good, good going. Tonight, though, I'm going to talk about ticks. And one of the things that I've learned from my earliest days here in Rhode Island, people would say to me, Doc, just tell me what I need to know when I need to know it. And so we're going to talk about the what and when of tick protection right now, hoping that you will be ready for ticks. Um, they're already out, as you probably all already know, and if you don't know, you will by the time um, we're finished tonight. But by the time we're finished tonight, my goal is that you will know um, really effective things that you can do to help protect yourself and your family and your pets. So I just have to figure out how to change my slide. There you go. So I like to start this kind of a talk with the fact that um, there's good news and bad news in the world generally, but when it comes to ticks, it's usually mostly bad news. And um, there are just more ticks in more places and more likely more to come. Um, and this is a changing dynamic, even though everyone maybe said, oh, well, I know we've had this tick or that tick, but I get email after email telling me that they've lit, people have lived in this same place for 15 years and they've never had a tick and this is the first time that they've had them and so those are the people that we're talking about they may have had them when they've been at camp or something but not at home and so there's a changing dynamic in the tick world and we're going to talk a little bit about that several years ago i guess it's been about four now um, cdc used to record just the cases that docs, the cases of Lyme disease that docs would submit to them. And that usually would be between 25 and 30,000 cases a year. And so that was the official um, count of how many people got Lyme disease every year, like 20 to 30,000. But everyone kind of sensed that it must be a lot higher. And so the CDC in 2013 figured out a different way of estimating the number of cases they basically looked at um, they, they realized doctors maybe weren't submitting this through the health departments but they certainly were going to submit their bills to insurance companies to be paid and so they used that as one of their criteria and immediately the estimated count went from about 30,000 cases a year to about 300,000 of cases a year and this is new cases of Lyme disease every year, but the, the news actually seems to get worse because that was 2013. And just recently they upgraded that estimate so that now there's nearly a half a million new cases of Lyme disease occurring in the United States each year. And then to top that all off, a health style survey that was done by the CDC showed that almost a quarter of American households reported at least one tick encounter every year. Think about that for a minute. I mean, we think about our own little Rhode Island, but the United States has got a lot of households and the fact that a quarter of them are, are encountering a tick 
um, is pretty incredible to think about. And I think that's a problem. Whenever people are getting sick from something, that's always a problem. And if they're getting sick from these ticks that are in more places, that's even more of a problem. And this more ticks in more places situation that we find ourselves in seems to be coming right at a, at a point in time where we have greater access than ever to information. But unfortunately, a lot of the information about ticks is relatively low quality. It's what I would call bordering on sometimes misinformation. And so we have more people becoming aware and looking for information, but there's still not a, a whole lot of great information out there, or it's mixed with bad information. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. <clears throat> Here's something that was just ripped from the headlines maybe in the last day or two. So there was a study that was done in California that showed that ticks that cause Lyme disease are as plentiful near beaches as in the woods. And most of us here in Rhode Island live near beaches and we it's like that would that would not surprise us. Ticks causing Lyme disease as plentiful near beaches as in the woods. But when you couple it with B-roll like this from NBC News, that message then becomes ticks are on the beaches. Really? And so I think it's really important and I underline the word near beaches. That's got to be the word that we look for, but I bet most people looked at this picture and said, oh my God, now we're gonna get ticks on the beaches. And if they found a tick on while they're sitting on the beach because they have time to look at their nearly naked body, um, they will remember that oh, they must have gotten the tick on the beach and will forget that they walked from their car through that brushy path um, over here. They won't even really remember that. They'll think that the ticks are on the beaches because they heard it on the news. And so this is really, uh, I think, a, a huge problem that we have with this low quality tick information and hard to judge for most people, unless you're a tick expert. So a few years back, I was being interviewed on a television station and the guy said bef just before we went on, so what do you want to talk about? And I said, probably whatever's on your teleprompter there is what you're going to ask me. And he said, no, no, really. And I said, well, I think that everyone seems to know something about ticks. Everyone seems to know something about ticks, but unfortunately, oftentimes what they know is just wrong enough to give them a false sense of security and leave them at risk. And he was like, I don't understand what you what you mean. And I said, well, you tell me two things you know about ticks. And he said, well, I know that they fall out of trees onto your head and I know they die in the winter. And I said, and you'd be just wrong enough to still be at risk because while you're worrying about the ticks falling on your head, you're missing the ones crawling up your legs and sticking sort of in your groin area. And if they all died in the winter, where would next year's ticks come from anyway? And he, his, his eyes got wide and he goes, well, we should talk about that. Now, mind you, we did not talk about that. We talked about what the producer had put on the teleprompter, but it made me think there's a lot of just wrong enough information out there in people's minds that still leaves them at risk. And my job as a tick expert should be to get people to be just right enough so that they're all doing effective strategies and practices to protect themselves from ticks. And so we're gonna really kind of hone in on this concept um, tonight, the, the when and what of protecting yourselves. So here's another scenario that sometimes happens to me. Actually, at this time of the year, it's the first thing that most reporters will, will lead with when they're asking me, um, how bad are the ticks going to be this year? And, you know, when I was younger, I probably would say, oh, they're going to be bad, right? It's an easy thing to say because for most people, more than one tick is probably bad because they may only encounter one tick. So I would always be right. But a little while ago, I realized that that's just feeding into this, this phenomenon that I call tick literacy deficit. 
it's really that low quality tick information, leaving people with sort of uh, uh, inappropriate level of tick literacy because it's often wrong. So I thought, well, how am I going to combat this tick literacy deficit phenomenon that's out there? Well, I decided that when I'm asked this question, I now say, well, first we have to unpack that question because what kind of tick are you asking me about is going to be bad because ticks is not a generic thing. There's different species and the different species do different things. They transmit different germs. They have different lifestyles. They're affected by different environmental factors. They feed on different hosts. So just saying what, you know, are the ticks going to be bad? That that's misleading because you can't give just one answer. You know, are you talking about the ticks in West Virginia? Or are you talking about the ticks in Maine? Right? So we, we, it, it gets really hard when you're asked these questions by some national media outlet because they don't really want to get down in the nitty and the gritty of it. They just want their answer. And so then, you know, I usually say, but by unpacking this, we can be more specific and be more precise. And so that often then wakes them up a little bit. They didn't know to ask that question. And so then we start talking about, you know, where are we talking about? And so we give specific examples so that people that are reading the information or seeing it on TV know whether it relates to them or not. We also do that through our website, Tick Encounter. You can see that, you know, I, if I could see a show of hands, how, how many people are familiar with Tick Encounter? We've just launched a new look with a lot of hard work, um, a whole team of folks working on reorganizing things, bringing some new products online, keeping the same features that people always appreciated about the old Tick Encounter, but giving it a new look and hopefully maybe a different way of finding the information. And so we're going to share a lot of the information from the new version of Tick Encounter tonight. But one of the things that I think makes Tick Encounter stand out as a national resource from even the CDC's website is the fact that we focus on the when and what and where. So the geographic relevance, the seasonal relevance, it's not just one picture all of the time. It changes through the seasons. The maps information change through the seasons. And the messages that come out through both Tick Encounter and our social media change depending on the season and where people are. And so that's, I think, really um, a significant difference from most um, tick and disease websites. So, for instance, you could read the story about being just wrong enough on the blog section on the new on the new website. You might enjoy reading reading how we came up with that. And we're going to talk about that, and you'll see how I get that message reinforced to me on a daily on a daily basis. But we also have Tick Smart actions, and that's front and center on the website as well, Tick Smart Actions. And we could have had 20 Tick Smart Actions, but we realized that most people are struggling to even do one vigilantly. And so we left it with five. You know, for me, being able to just count things on one hand is usually pretty good. And so five Tick Smart Actions, if we could get people to do two of them on a regular basis, we'd be saving a lot of people a lot of misery from tick-borne diseases. Knowing the kinds of ticks that are active where you live throughout the year and being able to identify them um, is really important. And we'll go into that. Performing daily tick checks, the operative word there is daily, um, especially checking for ticks below the belt, the tiny nymphal stage ticks, because they often don't get above the belt. Turning your clothes into tick repellent clothing is the best way to protect yourself treating your yards with tick killing ins insecticides. And the operative word there is tick killing rather than just something that you hope is killing ticks. And then of course, if you have a pet, protecting your pet using effective products is really important. So those five are our top core tick smart actions. 
and we're going to talk just briefly about the knowing. I think that it's a good place to start and to be honest it's the lowest hanging fruit for someone who's just deciding now that they want to know enough about ticks to, to not be dangerous but to help them and their families. So why is it important to be able to identify the different types of ticks correctly? Well, so these are the three most commonly encountered human biting ticks in North America. Black-legged ticks on the West Coast, the Western black-legged tick is a close cousin of this. And these ticks have their own suite of germs, Lyme disease, human babesiosis, it's a parasite, human anaplasmosis, a relapsing fever bacteria, and a virus, Powassan encephalitis virus. But when you switch gears and you talk about American dog ticks, you have to erase all of those germs because they don't transmit any of them. Instead, they have their own germs. One is Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and another one is tularemia, often, often known as uh, rabbit fever. And when you get to Lone Star ticks, which are making insurgents into this area in Rhode Island, now, you'd also have to erase those germs because they have their own things that they do. They transmit germs that cause ehrlichiosis. They have a commensal organism that screws up testing for, um, testing for ticks. If you don't have a specific primer in the test, you'll say your tick will come back positive because it has this germ, but it's not really a germ that causes disease in humans. And it sometimes very rarely can transmit the Rocky Mountain spotted fever germ. This is a protozoan parasite that may be coming to our area soon. And I say that it's very common in these ticks where bobcats are found. Bobcats are the reservoir, the animal that carries this cytoxoan parasite. And we're seeing bobcats in Rhode Island and other areas in New England now. And so we have the right tick, we have the right animal, and potentially we could have the right parasite. Now why I mention this, this is not a danger to people, but it is deadly to cats and these ticks will feed on cats. So um, just something to keep in mind um, for the future. I know I'm saying a lot of bad news about ticks, but you gotta know, otherwise you won't listen to the message. So knowing the kinds of ticks, how many of you feel confident that you could identify the type of tick um, that you found on you or your children or your pet? Well, I like to start here, so I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried. This was something that came into our Facebook page. This picture of this tick on this poor little girl, Liz's granddaughter. I, I, I like this because you can just sort of picture this grandmother thinking to herself, oh my God, my daughter's gonna kill me. My poor little granddaughter's got a tick. Um, no one wants to think about that, to be honest. Well, what kind of tick is it? she decided to ask Facebook. And you gotta love the responses that she got. She has a bunch of friends that are sort of following her and they are all pretty helpful, maybe. You know, here's one that said, bring it to the ER or the pediatrician and they can even test it for Lyme disease. You know, I don't know one pediatrician or ER doc that really wants to see your tick because they actually don't really know. They may know where the resources are to figure it out eventually, but they're, they're, they're not entomologists. This woman, Maha, said, this tick is not a deer tick. I love boldness in people and she is very bold. It's not a deer tick, she said. Liz said she was having trouble telling from the pictures that she found online. And so Elaine says it's too big to be a deer tick, but she hates ticks, so you really can't trust what Elaine is thinking about ticks anyway. Paula down here is one of the ones that perplexes me the most. She says that deer ticks are almost microscopic. So she's in that this is too big category, but this looks like an ordinary tick to her. I can't find the genus or species name for the ordinary tick. So I don't know what she's really talking about. But all of these friends, unfortunately, 
were just wrong enough, leaving poor Liz with bad information. You see where it comes from. So we were able to tell her when we finally came on that this was indeed a black-legged tick female and it had been attached for about two and a half days. We'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> anyway, half of these ticks from where Liz is writing from are infected with the Lyme disease germ. And they also are infected with some of those other germs as well. So this was a, a bad news situation for poor Liz. But she took solace in the fact that it wasn't, she wasn't watching her daughter two and a half days ago. So at least it wasn't her fault. Now, I, I know that may sound crass, but, um, you know, you can, you know, you're still worried about the little girl, and I'm sure she's fine now, but um, at least she found out. Well, how would you know how to identify the tick? So this is from the new tick encounter under the field guide to ticks. So you can see a simplified navigation bar here. So go to field guides, you see these cards, you can click on this card and up will come something that teaches you about tick anatomy. In particular, to identify a tick correctly, you need to focus your eyes on this feature right here called the sputum. Notice that the sputum is, stays the same no matter how big the tick gets as it feeds. So these are both female black-legged ticks, but the sputum has stayed the same. It doesn't expand, whereas the rest of the body expands as the tick sucks in blood. So the sputum is really, really important. And so you can see of those ticks that are um, the most common ones, they all have something different going on at the sputum level. Even if they're full of blood, you can tell what they are as long as you focus your attention just on the sputum. So we have ticks with plain sputums. We have ticks with pigment on their sputums. Sometimes the pigment is concentrated. Sometimes the pigment is dispersed. And here's another plain sputum tick, but it looks different because this one has long straight mouth parts. You can see it better here. And this one has short triangular mouth parts. So a combination of plain sputum and mouth parts gets you right to what type of tick this is. So here they are here. These are black legged ticks that with plain sputums and long straight mouth parts. The Lone Star tick with this pigment concentrated at the back end of the sputum. American dog ticks with the pigment sort of dispersed in the sputum. And then, as we mentioned, this plain sputum. There's one other difference, if you can notice, these little things, scientists have called these eye spots that they really aren't eyes, they're just spots. And notice that this brown dog tick has them on the corners of the sputum, but the black-legged tick doesn't have them. So. If you just wanted to become an expert tick identifier, just focus first on the sputum, then the mouth parts, and then you'll be probably 70%, 80% correct all of the time. Now, what about the males? So the sputum on the female covers the first top third of the body of the tick, but on the male, it covers the entire body. Now, sometimes people call this a shield because it's thicker. And um, if you were a warrior, you'd like to have a shield for protection and ticks are warriors for sure. They need protection from the scratching of animals and the dust that they get abraded with because inside of this tick is a bunch of stuff, but mostly it's its internal body moisture. Just like human bodies are made up of 70% water, so ticks have that same thing going on. But in their case, if they get a leak, it leaks out before they can recharge themselves. It's not like they're always sipping on water or anything like that. And so you'd like to have a covering over your whole body, but a female tick can't afford that because she needs to be able to expand. The male ticks don't really take a blood meal or at least a large blood meal. And so they don't need to expand and so they can be covered by their sputum. So that's what's going on down here with the pigmented sputum. If you spread all that pigment out over the entire sputum and the sputum covers the body, it just looks like that. So you can always tell the males from the females. The females have the short sputum and the males have a sputum that covers the whole body. 
Well, so let's just say that you don't want to be a tick expert and or you're not certain. The good news is that our program has a program called Tick Spotters, which is really a fast free portal to a tick expert. So you find this tick expert with your tick picture. So you fill out a form and you include a picture. Hopefully it's a picture that's in focus. Like if you can't tell that it's a tick, then the person at the other end probably can't tell either, just warning you. But um, you can start a relationship with your tick expert through this tick spotters program. And so this is what it kind of looks like. So we get a comment here. This person said, oh, but this was only embedded for about 12 hours. Really? Because that tick has been attached to the person feeding for about three to four days. So but they don't remember that they were out three to four days ago. They only remember that they were out yesterday evening and now they found the tick the next morning. So they think about the most recent thing, just just like we mentioned on the people on the beach while they're sitting there and they see a tick on them, they figure that it must have come from the beach, not the walk to the beach. So this is one of those just wrong enough moments. Here's another one. This one actually they took it to the doctor and the doctor was emphatic and said they were not deer ticks. Well, these are black legged ticks or deer ticks. These, this one's been attached for about a day and this one probably for about a day as well. So you can see they look a little bit different. It's harder to tell at a day. It's less hard to tell when they've been attached for two or three or four days. But again, just wrong enough. So here's one that sent the people into a panic. They've been panicking all day since they pulled this off of their seven-year-old. Well, if you found that on your seven-year-old, you'd probably be panicked too, but they imagined that the kid was outside yesterday. So they felt it was attached for just 20 hours. That tick's been on that kid for three to four days getting there. They just don't get to look like that unless they've been attached for that amount of time. So another just wrong enough moment, leading to them to perhaps think it's not so risky. So this is the way our message comes to you, um, usually within 24 hours. Um, it tells you sort of what kind of ticket is and how long it's been attached. Then there's some public health messaging and some prevention strategies that will help you. It's tailored to the type of tick that you have encountered. So people want to know, how would you know how long that tick was attached? You weren't here with me in the backyard. You weren't on our picnic or whatever. How would you know that? And so we have this handy dandy guide and it's part of the tick field guide cards. You can see how ticks change their appearance the longer they're attached and feeding. So when I used to go to deer hunt check stations and talk to the hunters about the ticks on their deer, they'd say, Doc, you're crazy. You say there's only one type of tick on my deer, but my deer had this kind of tick and this kind of tick and this kind of tick. And I said, yep, they're all the same kind of tick. They change their appearance the longer they've been attached. And they significantly change their appearance, but what stays the same is the sputum, right? Same way with American dog ticks. And we actually have charts for several different types of ticks so that you can tell nymphs and adults of different species of ticks um, and how long they've been attached. So estimating how long they've been attached is significant in that the longer they're attached, the more likely it is that they will have transmitted, transmitted um, an infectious dose of any germs they might be carrying. So now we we know that identifying them, we know what germs they might be carrying and by identifying how long they've been attached, we can better judge how risky um, that tick bite is. It turns out that of the people that submit ticks to tick encounter or to tick spotters, that about a third have been attached for longer than a day and a half, which makes them significantly riskier for transmitting germs like the Lyme disease germ. So somewhere like that, they don't really look that different, 
but they certainly have been attached long enough. So this becomes a riskier tick. And the longer that they've been feeding, the riskier they are if they are infected. So you can see here the nymphs, how they change their appearance as well. We have some special information, like if it was a lone star tick, like that, that one, they've been associated with people developing a red meat allergy. So we can have steer people towards information about that as well. Um, so these messages truly are tailored to the type of tick that the person is encountering. And so that's tick spotters. And so look for that on our Tick Encounter website if you have a tick and you're not sure what type of tick it is, or you want to just receive some of this great information on how to be tick smarter the next time, um, before the next time happens that you encounter a tick. A new tool that we have on, um, we couldn't come up with a better name, so it's called the Tick Finder Map. So if you want to find what types of ticks are active at any given time, so you can change this toggle to the time, you can identify the place, and then you can see the types of ticks you might encounter. And we have them portrayed in different stages of engorgement as well, because who knows whether they've been on for a day or three days or five days or longer. And so this actually scrolls. And from that, you can see what germs that the different types of ticks transmit as well. And so this is a great tool if you're planning a vacation, you wanna know what ticks you might encounter in July, if you're going to Nebraska, for instance, or something like that. Although I'm not sure why you wanna to go to Nebraska in July, but I hear, I hear it's nice. Anyway, so this is, a I think, gonna be a really valuable tool and it's on our tick field guide as well. But what we really wanna talk about is getting ready for ticks. So let's just imagine that you're standing at the start of a trail and you see a sign that looks like this, warning tick habitat. So what should you do? Should you continue down? Are you going to know what to do, what it means to be tick smart, to take protection? Are you gonna have the ability to remember? Well, so what we're hoping to do, and this is a new program that we're hoping to launch real soon, is that you could use your smartphone and get information of what you could do now, what you could do um, when you get home, what you might wanna do before you go out the next time. And so it'll all be sort of packaged together, um, giving you helpful ways to be ready for ticks. So for instance, right now you're standing at the trailhead and the kids don't wanna turn around and go home. They wanna go on an adventure. So stay in the middle of the trails. Make sure your shirt's tucked in as well as perhaps your pants are tucked into your socks like this person has done. But if you stay in the middle of the trails, the ticks are gonna be more on the leafy edges. If the trail is nice and wide like this, it may be fine, but you'll be surprised um, how you end up wandering because you're not paying attention to it. But hopefully you're thinking about it because the sign said, warning, ticks in this area. And it's something simple. You can just stay in the middle of the trails. But most people, these people are good. They've tucked their shirt in. But you might say, well, why am I doing that? So some of the ticks, the nymphal stage ticks get on at shoe level and they crawl up your leg. But the adult stage ticks get on at knee level and crawl up the outsides of your clothing. If you're wearing shorts, they could crawl up the insides of your clothing too. But um, in the fall or in the spring, it's too cool to wear shorts. And so they're up underneath an untucked shirt before you even know it. And so you're instead of looking at your legs for the ticks that maybe have crawled up, you need to be looking at your upper body for those ticks. So it depends on the type of tick. Again, adult stage ticks, latch on at knee level or so and crawl up underneath shirts. So it's a good idea to tuck your shirt in as well. So what about when you just got home? What are some things you could do then? Well, the first thing right now we're finding people are carrying ticks into their homes on their clothing or their pets. And so the best way to, is to strip off your clothes right away, throw them in the dryer for about 10 minutes on high heat, and that will kill the ticks. 
even before you wash the clothes or leave them in a hamper only to be found by some unsuspecting person doing laundry the next day or two. But also performing a thorough tick check is a good idea. So what's your tick check look like? I mean, most people that I ask what's their tick checks looks like, they hold up their, their arms and at eye level and say, well, you know, I check for ticks regularly. Well, that's fine if the ticks are going to be on your arms, but what about the ticks that latched on at shoe level and crawled up here? When was the last time you actually looked there anyway? I mean, but that's what you have to do. It's hard. You know, years ago, my wife got tired of doing that for me, and so she bought me this great big mirror. But now my glasses fall off my head when I'm turning upside down. But maybe think about calling it tick yoga, get the kids to do it. Um, it it'll, it'll help. We have helpful cards that you can put places where you might be naked. That's a good time to think about doing a tick check, like in the bathroom, where to look, where to focus your attention, um, and different types of ticks. So we have these cards under our Tick Smart product section. We also, <clears throat> you know, you might think I'm being a little bit crass here, but this works. You know, sitting on the toilet, you can see pretty much your bottom part down here pretty well for ticks that you might not have the ability to do leaning over. But while you're sitting there, um, it's good. So, you know, Kate mentioned earlier that part of the healthy lifestyles um, section of our cooperative extension, you know, this really brings it full circle because if you eat a high fiber diet, you'll go regularly, meaning you'll sit on the toilet at least once a day and you can do a daily tick check. Um, and so you just have to pay attention to what you're looking for. And so we have this little card you could put right by the toilet paper to remind yourself what to do. So what if you found a tick? These are best practices, removing a tick safely, then taking a picture of it, a clear picture of the top side, please. The best pictures we have instructions on how to take great pictures. You may think you know how to take a picture of a tick, but um, usually they come out a little bit less than satisfactory. But um, we've looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of them now. And so if you lay it flat on a white surface, top side up, your autofocus of your camera will actually do a much better job of making the tick be in focus than if it's like on some convoluted surface or background. Um, anyway, and then you can submit the tick picture to tick spotters and get back um, all of the great information we were talking about, usually in less than 24 hours. So here's an example. Here was a tick spotter picture recently, and this is a male Lone Star tick. Look, there's that white pigment. It's at the back end of the sputum, and this is the front end of the tick, and you can see it. It stopped because of these things called palps. These things fold back and the mouth part is stuck inside the skin. Oh, you want to see what that looks like? So that's what it looks like. That's what a tick puts inside of you, just this part. It's called the hypostome, or the mouth. Look at those nasty backward pointing barbs, which help keep it from getting pulled out until it wants to be pulled out when it's full of blood. And then it can extract itself by softening those and just slip right out of your skin. But here's the head of the tick here, and then the legs back there. So the head never really goes much further than, than this. Maybe your skin is inflamed and grows up around the head a little bit, thinking that it was really embedded in you or something. But this is really all that goes inside of you. But here's the number one fear people have, that they broke the head off, and that somehow that leaves them at risk. Well, it turns out that the germs are back here in the salivary glands. And once you break the connection of the salivary glands with the saliva going into the tick, into the host from the tick's mouth part, there's no more transmission of germs. So you don't need to go rushing to the emergency room to have them cut open your skin and remove the mouth part. If you can get it out with a second try with the tweezers, great, that's just great. But it's not necessarily critical to do that. More important is that you don't squeeze the tick as you're taking it out. We'll talk about that in just a second. Here's an improper 
tick removal because they didn't have a pointy tweezer. So they squeeze this tick. What happens if this is like a tube of toothpaste and you squeeze that? It call, everything that's inside sort of rushes to the front and comes out. And thinking about ticks and germs, you certainly don't want to squeeze germs into you while you're trying to take the tick off. And so you might want to get a pointy tweezer. And this is a great tool um, by one of our Tick Smart partners, Tickies, has two ends, has a pointy tweezer at one end, so you can get right to the head of the tick. And if you are in a sensitive area or you have a great big engorged tick, you can just use this slotted end to pry the tick off as well. So Tickies is a, is a very effective product, as are other things, but they need to be pointy tweezers. We see so many pictures of people with their tweezers, and there's no way they could not squeeze their tick with the tweezers that they have. So everyone should own at least one pair of pointy tweezers. So I put this up here just for you to consider how much you've learned already tonight. So this was a tick spotter picture, and I see three things wrong with this picture. I don't know how many you see, but I'll start with the fact that it's engorged. This tick has been engorging for over five days. Well, that's not tick smart because you could have been doing a tick check and maybe found it much sooner. And so then they decided to make their own slotted little device to pull the tick out. And it looks like it worked in this time, but it probably wouldn't work against a little nymphal stage tick. So relying on something homemade like this, while it's creative and inventive, it may not be the most effective thing. But mostly I see they're getting ready to flush it down the sink. And they did take a picture and they did send it in. So I guess that's a good thing. But holding on to the tick in case you might want to have it tested later, like if symptoms of disease occur or something like that, would be a tick smart thing to do. And you can simply put it in a Ziploc bag and throw it in the freezer, maybe label it with the date and who it was on or whatever, in case you want to fish it out of the freezer later and, um, and have it tested. It would still be quite viable to test for germs at that point. So going outside again, you want to be ready for ticks too. What are some things that you could, maybe you weren't ready the first time when you first saw that sign, but you want to be ready the next time. And so thinking about some of the tick smart things that you could do before you go out and be decide to be an outsider, you could spray your shoes with tick killing permethrin. And there are several brands, but spraying your shoes, usually it'll last for about a month. Um, and this is very good way to protect against those little nymphal stage and larval stage ticks that latch on at shoe level and then crawl up your leg. Um, this is very effective at um, keeping ticks from biting. And since you only have to do it when the nymphs are active, May, June, July, and August, and you can, it lasts for a month, you could just plan to organize your calendar so that it, you do it like on the first of every month, make it easy to remember or some other time, but just remember to do it once a month. Do, while you're doing that, you might want to spray the insides of your pant, pant legs as well as the outside, because remember, the ticks may be crawling up the inside, not just on the outside. And if you spray it yourself, it can go through the laundry about five times before you need to do it again. If you buy the clothes already pre-treated, they can go through the laundry a lot longer, maybe 20 times, maybe up to 70 times. And so that's really the most cost effective strategy to buy clothes from partners like um, Insect Shield that do the, do the job for you. There are many retailers now that have insect repellent clothing. And so you should have a few of those, especially for your high risk opportunities like walking your dog two or three times a day. Speaking about dogs, this could be happening to your dog right now. So guess what? You probably recognize that this is an American dog tick because of that white pigment diffuse on its sputum. And this is just a mess. 
of scab and everything. So this tick has been attached and it's been scratched at by the dog, maybe people, whatever. But no matter, it's been able to get a blood meal um, and it's not quite completely full, but it's been attached for over five days. And this could be happening on your dog right now. I mean, this dog knows that it's not going out for a walk until the owner has protected it. So hopefully by now, you're familiar with the fact that this is tick season. And if you have a pet, you need to protect your pet with an effective product, either a topical product or a chew product that kills ticks if they do attach once they start feeding. Collars, certain collars, resto collars work well as well, killing ticks on contact. But your dog knows um, and it doesn't want ticks and you don't want ticks on your dog either. But what we're finding, especially at this time of year, is that there are too many ticks that are too engorged on your pets. These are all ticks been attached for three, four or five days. They should have been killed already if your pet was protected with an effective product. And so there's something we can do about that. It turns out that when we look at tick spotter data, we see that every year, high risk ticks, those that have been attached and feeding for three or four days, um, far exceed the low risk ticks. So on pets, particularly, ticks manage to get through to being partially fed. And if they were infected, they've been able to transmit an infectious dose of the germs. Well, so this is the same result in the fall when these black-legged ticks first come out and in the springtime when they reemerge when the weather warms up a little bit. So I was thinking, but you know, the veterinary pharmaceutical companies are really good at putting ads out to remind you starting usually in March um, or so. But for most people, they're not thinking about ticks. They thought like that reporter did that ticks were killed in the winter and they're just waiting for the new tick season to come along, which will happen later in the spring. That's what they think they know about ticks. But they would be wrong, right? And so we need to change that way of thinking and start our pet protection sooner. And you can see here are high risk ticks in March, April, really a lot. So people haven't got gotten practice going yet. They think it's not tick season yet. And then when they get going, the number of ticks drop way off on the pets. So if you wanna set your pet up for springtime success, just start treating earlier. Um, you know, even on a warm day in February or January, these black legged ticks could be active. And so you, it, you only need a few warmer, warmish days with a January thaw and the ticks will come out. So you may want to consider treating your pet all year, all year round. But if you want to break, make sure at least that you start back treating it again by March. And so when you think about it, even your pet's wondering about this. You're busy protecting the pet, but what about yourself? Because when you're walking your pet, you're only about three feet from the same places that you think that the dog is walking and is exposed to ticks. So um, you may be exposed as well. So why not couple your pet's protection with the same time that you're doing protection for yourself, like spraying your shoes? All of that sort of win suggests that you might be aided by a calendar. And so one of my brilliant assistants came up with this idea. She is a very active woman with a busy life. She needs a calendar to stay organized. And I guess I don't do enough because I, I have not a Google calendar, but now I do because I see the value in it. But we made a TickSmart Google calendar. So you could add this to your own Google calendar, TickSmart tips that are timely that will give you information when you need to know it, when you should be doing something, taking some of these actions. So I hope you'll check this little feature out. And it's also right on our, right on our um, page. This is what it might look like. So this is a very busy calendar, but you can see the tick smart tips are there. And they, they're only maybe five or six um, a month just to remind you what might be happening in the tick world during that month and what maybe you could remember to do before the weekend when you're gonna be out 
and exposed to ticks, like treating your shoes or um, making sure that you are ready for going out to where the ticks are. Simple messages that pop up that can, can be helpful. So this is just transitioning a little bit to where we are sort of right now. So this is something that would shock pretty much anybody finding this on their lawn furniture, 26 ticks on their lawn glider just a week or so ago. The American dog ticks seem to be having a banner year this year. This is the male, of course, and the female just looking at the sputum. Well, what in the world's going on? So in April, we sort of got a little bit of a heads up on this. So this is looking at data from 2019, 2020, and then this past April. And you can see totally in terms of submissions, at least people finding ticks and submitting them to tick spotters, tick counts are a little bit up. But look at what's driving, driving the whole thing. The American dog ticks seem to be up the most relative to the other species of ticks that get submitted. So this seems to be a banner year for American dog ticks. The bad news is those American dog ticks will continue to be active through the end of July. Then they start to disappear, but through the end of July, you're gonna to have to face this. The other thing is that these are hardier ticks than black-legged ticks. They can live in more sunny, exposed, open areas. In fact, sometimes they cluster even on homes or doors as they're attracted to the warmth and the carbon dioxide. Um, so they may even move across a lawn towards a place that they sense a host might be. So that's a little bit scary, but you know, you can take some of the precautions that we have given you already and take solace in the fact that you know that American dog ticks at least won't transmit the Lyme disease germ to you. But here's what's happening. We see this a lot, um, that they found a tick. It was an American dog tick, and they assume that it came in with the dog or came in on the clothing. But once inside, that's the last thing people are thinking that they're going to be at risk. So this time of year with more American dog ticks than ever, um, we're focusing on warning people that they may get ticks inside. They won't set up an infestation, at least a long-term infestation, but I've done a little experiment, sort of a kitchen countertop experiment at my house. And most of the American dog ticks that are brought inside will die usually within about two or three days, but some of them can live as long as two weeks, depending on the humidity um, in your house. So just keep that in mind. Certainly, this may be the time of year that you stop letting your pet sleep with you because so many people are finding ticks in their bed um, and the ticks are moving from pets to people. Remember the male, in particular wants to move once it's taken its first blood meal. It's going searching for a female at that point. So it could end up on you or your family members other than your pets. So who knows what May is going to show because um, it's really unpredictable um, until it happens. We're halfway through May now and the tick counts keep going higher and higher and the American dog ticks are staying strong in the count. So um, it looks like it's a, a banner year for American dog ticks this year. Well, I'm gonna stop there. Hopefully we've shown you the value of tick spotters for you, but the value for us is that it helps us sort of see people's lived experiences for ticks. So it's sort of a listening tool for us. You start that relationship, we see your tick, we see what you think, and then it helps guide our messaging so that we can better answer sort of the, the what for your um, message. Anyway, um, with that, I just wonder if Kate would launch a short poll one question, do you feel more confident now after this webinar that you will be ready for ticks the next time you go out? And so hopefully take just a second and fill that out. <clears throat> I think we'll see the, see the results in a, in a little bit.
And I'm happy to answer some questions if there are any. You're on mute, Kate. A year into the pandemic and we still have to tell you. Nope. <clears throat> Is there anybody out there that reads slips? Do I have to stop sharing my screen maybe? No. Nope. Maybe you have like me, one of these little buttons that you've accidentally yep. hit. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good gracious. All right, we, we do that have questions. That was embarrassing, wasn't it? <laughs> oh gosh, it could be so much worse. So Stephanie's asking, um, if you can talk potentially a little bit about the vaccine for Lyme that Valneva and Pfizer started working on again recently. Yeah, I can't, I can't really talk too much about that. Um, it's a, it's a little bit of a recast of the old Lyme Rix vaccine, but hopefully in the intervening 20 years, we've learned a lot about developing vaccines. We certainly should after the, what we've just gone through. So, um, my only word of caution about that is it's a Lyme disease vaccine. It doesn't protect against the other germs that ticks can transmit. And back in the day when the old Lyme Rix vaccine, people would say, just like we're used to saying now, I got the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. Well, what about the other germs? Are you going to really change your behavior um, much um, when, you know, yes, yeah, sort so 25% of the nymphal stage ticks are carrying the Lyme disease germ, but 10% of them are carrying babesiosis or anaplasmosis. You know, it's that the difference in risk, is it that great? So you still need to be focusing on the other things that you can do, the personal protection, the killing ticks in your yard, the protecting your pets, and the vaccine for added insurance. Great. I hope that answers your question, Stephanie. Um, so Rusty asks a nice philosophical question. Why do ticks exist? Do they serve any positive ecological benefit? Well, guess what, Rusty? They were here before you and I were. <laughs> so I think they have more, more of a right than we do. Um, just looking at it from the whole scheme and the universe thing. Um, so um, I don't know that that's a satisfying answer for you. Um, they don't really... You know, in some cases, you know, transmitting germs um, could be thought of as population regulation, probably for some very susceptible animal populations. But I, again, I go back to the fact that ticks were here long before um, um, mo most of this, you know, would have been in play. So I think they're just, they, they win and um, we just have to be ready for them. Awesome. Um, is there a particular amount of time it takes a tick to attach itself once it's walking on your body? Well, it can wander around for hours. It can attach in five minutes. It really just kind of depends on the tick's motivation. If we, you know, maybe Rusty wants to get into that kind of psychotherapy thinking <laughs> there. Um, but, you know, if it gets if a tick is crawling up, generally I hear so often people say, oh, they like warm, dark places. No, they don't. They, they don't care about that. They don't like getting stuck in creases. And so it just turns out that a lot of your creases happen to be warm, dark places. And so, you know, it's not that they have a preference for warm, dark places. They just don't like getting stuck in creases, you know, like the back, of your arm where your shirt sleeve hits or the back of your knee or your underwear line or your bra strap or something like that. So 
um, those are places that need particular attention right at the base of your hairline for some of them. Except for the American dog tick, when it gets to your head, it's so powerful, it just moves right to the crown. So all ticks like to crawl up because there's more vascularization in most hosts in the head and the skin is, tends to be a little bit thinner. So it's easier to bite and steal blood. And so they all are adapted to crawling up and um, sometimes they get stuck and that's where they stop. Um, if you're doing gardening and you have a watch band, you need to push that up because they sometimes will get stuck right underneath your watch band. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Yeah, I think that was, I think that was good. If, if you've been treated for Lyme, do you have any protection against reinfection other than paying attention as, as you've described? Yeah, so there doesn't appear to be any natural immunity that develops if you've been bitten um, before. Um, there does, and this is something that we're focusing on in our some of our research here, there does appear to be a, an acquired resistance. So people find some proteins in tick saliva as foreign and they generate an immune response. So when you've been bitten the first time, maybe not, maybe even not the second time, but if you've been bitten several times, maybe you already know you get an itchy red response that sometimes alerts you to the fact that there's a tick there because you wonder what you're scratching at. And so that could potentially be the basis of a protective scheme that we could find the right proteins and make it into a vaccine, sort of an anti-tick vaccine. And if the tick is removed earlier because you either found it or it's just sort of been thwarted in its ability to feed, then it won't have had a chance to transmit a germ to you. So that's the concept. Mm. Um, just switching to permethrin, it, is the lifespan of permethrin on clothes dependent on the number of washes? They do it, you know, once a year and mark the clothes on the inside with the date. Yeah, so that's that not exactly point? true. I mean, it's hard to keep track of the number of washes and exposure, but permethrin breaks down in sunlight as well as just as a matter of time. We have tested clothing that's sort of been on the store shelf for over a year and it's still effective. But um, if it's been left out in the sunshine or um, been worn but not washed or something like that, um, that all rubs permethrin off of the fabric. So generally, is there a, a period of time you should reapply? Um, our, our studies have suggested that at least an annual reapplication, if you're doing it commercially, um, like Insect Shield will treat your own clothes using their, their commercial approach. So you can send your clothes, your favorite lucky golf shorts or whatever, and um, they'll treat them for you. But you, you probably need to do that at least once a year. And there's a question about benefits to spraying the house and yard um and whether commercial companies do a better job than someone could do on their own well <laughs> <laughs> one thing um, i'd ask you if you are trying to do it yourself um do you have a degree in chemistry um, because a lot of times people decide what concentration they're going to spray. Maybe they follow, maybe they put it to a hose, you know, a hose in sprayer or something like that. But then are you spraying all the right spots? Are you spraying where the ticks are or are you spraying where you think the ticks are? So the value there is that a good commercial sprayer has been trained to know the right places to go, the right times to do it, um, the right times not to do it and the right things not to spray. So if you're worried about bees, for instance, they know not to spray flowering clover. They know not to spray some of the flowers that are higher up on the vegetation that bees might go to. So um, yeah, I, I think they have the right equipment. And you know, the more important thing is, are they spraying the right product? So right now the marketplace is everyone's interested in natural products but we've done two rounds of testing sponsored by the CDC and have decided that most 
of the natural products that are marketed for tick control are just not ready for prime time. They're not protecting you. So you're spending money, you're thinking that you're protected, you're acting as though you've done all the right things, but you've used the wrong product. Those natural products just aren't giving you the level of protection that you need to stay safe. Sorry, I didn't do anything more than test them. It's not my fault. Please don't blame me. I'd like a nat nice natural product to work too. Most people think, oh, but it doesn't kill bees. Well, if it doesn't kill bees, it probably won't kill ticks either. And so, you know, by not spraying it where the bees go, that's the way to not kill bees. Um, and um, so that probably suggests that a, a professional applicator spraying a good product like bifenthrin or one of the other synthetic pyrethroid chemicals is the way to go. Those are highly effective. That answers a lot of questions about what, what should be sprayed um, in lawns that is lawns or or uh you know on the edge of wooded areas that is effective now one thing that i i will add to this that here in new england we've been mostly focused on black-legged ticks but now we've got like banner years of american dog ticks sometimes that can be annoying but we have lone star ticks coming into our area and those ticks will move out a little bit further into the lawn the lone star ticks still like it shady some of the time um, so they will take forays out further into the yard. Um, so we may need to move from that perimeter spray that we've always said for the black legged ticks that like to stay right on the edge and into the woods and maybe come out just a little bit further if you live where Lone Star ticks do. And Dr. Mather, there's a question about products. Do you have product um, suggestions on your website or a place where folks can go to find. Yeah, we do for pet products. We have a nice chart um, that it tries to explain the differences between whether it's a must bite to kill product, like some of the chew products or some of the topicals that kill before the ticks bite. Um, so under the protect your pet section, um, there there are some product suggestions there. We We really haven't developed too much in the way of product endorsements, except for that the synthetic pyrethroids are effective. And we will be adding information from some of our natural product testing um, coming as soon as we get a chance to. Robin is interested in cedar oils. Yeah, so, so, is, are, so yeah. is Robin and <laughs> many other people. And wouldn't it be nice if they worked? Yeah. That's, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Well, here's here's to science. Let me um, um, let me just see. So, and there's a lot of questions about preventing ticks from coming into the lawn from the woods. Um, the black-legged ticks won't really do that very very readily. Maybe occasionally they won't survive well in the middle of a sunny lawn, but Lone Star ticks can and will do that. American dog ticks certainly will do that. They'll even climb up on your lawn furniture like we saw in the picture. So, you know, um, if those are your issues, you know, but remember they're not transmitting the Lyme disease germ. So that, so yeah, that's if good you news. If you <laughs> exactly, if you encounter one of those, at least you don't have to be anxious about Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I guess uh, I wanted to end on a positive note, but there's a few questions about DEET. Is the active ingredient in DEET any of the things that you've said are effective? Well, DEET, DEET is a great um, repellent for mosquitoes and other biting flies, less so for ticks. It, it can work. What we've noticed is um, that on skin that's been freshly treated with DEET, the tick repellency is more that it caught it. I think it stings their feet and it, they, they basically high step like a weird creature from outer space. And so they end up falling off. They have eight legs, but you know, when you're busy high stepping, um, anything can happen. So what gets them off 
is fine, but that's only when it's freshly applied. It really isn't very long lasting. So, you know, to, to do it once and then be out for three hours, you're, you're out of protection in about 30 minutes. And no all one right. really wants to be reapplying it all the time. So that's why wearing it in your clothing is so much more effective. Stopping that, that up the leg migration. <laughs> Or even if they go up underneath your shorts, you know, somehow it, it's treated inside and outside and it's going to brush against them. Um, and it doesn't take much of an exposure um, to not, it doesn't just repel them, it kills them. So, um, and so it's just, it, it's really one of those things that um, anything that makes life simpler, um, so why not? why not do it? And we've done a study with outdoor workers recently, and we showed that in the first year, so they had their clothes treated in the first year of wearing these clothes to work every single day, that um, there was a 65 time uh, percent less likelihood that they would have a tick bite. And we didn't control for the fact that they might have been getting exposed to ticks when they weren't at work. So um, that's that's pretty impressive. So treat your clothes, use tick spotters. If you do find a tick, find out what it is, and then just incorporate the best practices that Dr. Mather shared with us. With that, I think we will bid you all adieu. This um, session is being recorded and it'll be posted on the URI Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. Dr. Mather, thank you for sharing your vast expertise with this captive audience folks join <laughs> us in two weeks for our next uh, learn at home webinar and until then stay safe everyone and thanks for being here good night good night